Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from the Marriott Hotel in Houston, Texas at the NARSAW 2019 conference, this is episode 80 of Registry Matters. Larry, I would say happy uh, Saturday night, but it's not. It's it's uh, it's Friday night. So here we are recording a podcast on a Friday night face to face with real microphones and an actual live participating audience. I never thought this would happen. How about that? Right. And we also have joining us tonight is Brenda Jones, who's the executive director of Narsal. Welcome, Brenda. Glad to be here, I think. And then we also have hundreds, hundreds of people in the audience. Is that an exaggeration? No. <laughs> Larry, what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about the conference and uh, decisions we're waiting for from the U.S. Supreme Court, and we're going to t- we're going to have uh, Justice uh, Scalia on the law ah. and the Constitution. That, that's about a two and a half minute segment. Okay, sounds good. Where do you want to start? Uh, so, well, we've got all these people here, so we probably ought to enter- entertain them. All right. Do you want to, let's see, so we're just one day into the conference plus the uh, introductions last night, right? One day into the conference, a day and a half to go. I heard, I, I sat in on a, uh, well, it's a day and a half. We still have Sunday, too. Day and a half to go. Okay. Uh, I, I sat in on a session with uh, Paul Dubling, and he was uh, talking about, like, the framework behind challenging these laws from a constitutional point of view. And from... Just my observation. I'm, I'm the dumb person over here. He has a way of framing the arguments and the process to bring challenges into the legislature that I, it, it, it's like 4D chess to me. He seems to have an incredibly savvy point of view of how to challenge these things from either a left or a right point of view. If you're talking to a, a right-leaning um, court versus a left court, you present your arguments of what you're trying to challenge in a different context. That is correct. Mr. Dubling is a brilliant when it comes to, to strategy. Uh, we don't get to pick our courts. We only get to pick our cases. And we pick our cases around what we think we're going to be, what court we're going to be in and what, what, their, what their disposition may be. Sometimes we guess wrong, but we've got a pretty good idea when we look, look at the Supreme Court of a state or of the United States of where they're coming from on their judicial philosophy. They tell us a lot in previous writings and their decisions and interviews that they give and and uh, and they, those tend to be rare but we do everything we can to figure out where they're likely to go and uh, and paul is, is a genius at that and figuring out what kind of arguments and what type of case to make depending on the the venue he's making the arguments so um i didn't get to sit in on that but but i've heard good good reviews one so i at the end of it i, I asked the question of how do we then, I mean, can we duplicate him 49 times? May not be possible to do 49. And, but even short of that, I asked him, is it financially a viable um, uh, vehicle that he's trying to, to ride down? I mean, we're generally a broke group of people. And I, I'm sure he makes a very healthy sum of money. And I, like, I'm sure he doesn't do it just out of the kindness of his heart. So he wants to get paid. What, is, what do we have to do to make it worth him or the Paul Doobling replicas so that they'll get involved? Well, we wish we had the answer. We're developing that model uh, little by little. We, what, we're doing, what we're doing is trying to figure out a way to take some of the risk out of the uh, attorney's side because these cases are complex and they're long drawn out and they devour a lot of labor hours and they devour uh, potentially a lot of investigative resources and expert witnesses. So at NARSL, we're trying to we're trying to leverage their willingness and their heart to not have to lose their time and their the, the out-of-pocket cost. And, and in some cases, we're able actually to provide some small amount of the attorney's fees in advance because we pick very carefully on the cases that we deploy our resources into. And if we can if we can get that message out that we have we have some small seed money for the right type of challenges are we, we, hopefully we'll grow more doublings and more attorneys we, we're we're going to launch a case in georgia uh where, where i'm headed headed next in the, in the state of georgia and we're, we're using that very model where we're providing a small amount of what would be the potential of attorney's fees up front and a small bucket of cost up front 
so that they're not absorbing all that risk themselves. But these cases, they're, they're not easy because the states, and the, if it's a state challenge or if it's a federal challenge, they have vastly superior resources that they're going to fight back with. And their, their job is to fight back, and people shouldn't be angry about that. The, the laws that are duly enacted, it's the job of the attorney general to defend those laws. And, and they, they're not supposed to pick and choose. They're supposed to defend the laws that are duly enacted. So they're going to fight back. Brenda, do you want to fill in any gaps there? How many do you think? How many attorneys do you think we need? Obviously, forty nine is a, well, a, a lofty goal. I but mean, don't we need? I mean, don't they have to be certified, whatever the right term is, licensed to be an attorney in that area, in that they, state? They do not. So Paul could come to Georgia and fight the case. He could, and he is on the team. Uh, what that process works through an admission, a limited admission. It's called pro hoc vice. And uh, that's a Latin term. So an attorney that's not, not licensed in a jurisdiction can practice there by, by a pro hoc vici admission. And each state is a little bit different. Sometimes there's a large fee of a couple hundred dollars and usually a local sponsor that's going to be responsible for seeing to it local rules are followed. But, but Paul can practice practically anywhere through that limited admission. Do you think we'd need to have, like, if we're, is there a certain number, do you think? I mean, like, say, if we're trying to take something to the Supreme Court, ultimately, is there some minimum number of cases that are all kind of targeting the same thing? Or uh, I didn't sit in on it either, so uh, I was in a different room. But uh, yeah, to, to, in order to, to to get something to the Supreme Court, as as Larry has instructed me, uh, there needs to be some conflict between lower court decisions, and then ultimately that that attracts the the attention of the U.S. Supreme Court who wants to try to settle those differences. So do we need just two of those? Do we need to have three? Do we need to have 15? I don't think we know the answer to how many attorneys we need. I think the one answer we know for certain is we need more of them. <laughs> uh, so we, we, need, we, need, we need more of them. But it depends on what we're trying to do. We're actually getting a lot better case law out of the state Supreme Courts than we are out of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, we'll, we'll get some guidance when, do, when Gundy is released before the end of uh, this month of June. Uh, if, they, if they dodge that delegation issue, then we'll get an idea that even though there's a great deal of desire to roll back the administrative state, if they figure out a way to duck it and, and deal with it later with Gundy, that'll tell us a lot about where their mind is on, on registration issues because they, they're not interested in revisiting it just yet. Uh, being that they get to pick and choose what cases they hear, then that will tell us that we need to continue working in state supreme courts and trying to get uh, where there's, a, where there's a, a, an inclination in the state. For example, in Maryland, the state constitution provides greater protection than the U.S. Constitution does. That was a nice place to litigate because we knew that in advance. Well, Maryland's not the only state where the constitution of the state provides greater protections in terms of ex post facto than the U.S. Constitution. Maryland has in, the, in, in their, their constitution any what is it what was the specific wording of that of that uh, declaration uh, of, of of rights it any was, diminishment of, of a person's yeah re any reduction. disabilities or, or any disability yeah it's like a, 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 an increase, a disability that occurs retroactively yeah oh so so we may we may find ourselves litigating more in state courts depending on where the gundy case goes if they take a broad sweep at the administrative state then that's going to tell us a whole different message because that'll tell us that SORN is on the table, that, that, that if they were willing to touch that, that they might be willing to touch some more, some more issues related to registration. So we'll know a whole lot more by the end of the month in terms of how this decision comes down and how they, how, uh, wh where we need to be litigating. Because the U.S. Supreme Court, of course, if they're ready to overturn a Smith versus Doe, that would have national, more national implications. Otherwise, you're trying to cobble together a a growing body of state supreme courts where you where you when you're litigating if we were to be litigating in my state of new mexico we would say well look what they did in indiana look what they did in maryland look what they did in oklahoma look what they did and we go on and on but none of that's binding it's only persuasive the new mexico supreme court can say that's nice uh doesn't apply <laughs> here but it begins to build a persuasive effect when they when they look at all the well-written opinions from around the country well, the same thing happened to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court is clearly right now, their position is that every registration case they've looked at, which has been few, but it's administrative. They have not looked at any cases dealing with all the evolution of the second and third generation registration schemes. 
So we don't know what they would say. What we do know is they said in 2003 that sending in a card confirming your residence, they said that wasn't punishment. But they didn't say that no matter what you do to the pe- uh, that it won't be punishment. They just said this isn't. That's all they could look at. That was all that was before them. So so we'll we'll have to wait and see. I think at the, at, when we do our podcast after Gundy comes down, after we've had a chance to analyze it, because we'll have a whole week from the time it comes out on a Monday, we'll be able to tell you more where we think this may head. I, you, you just went down a path that kind of blew my brain when you said, I, I think that you have said in the past that Gundy will have almost no impact on us as a whole. I think. And I have said that, yes. Okay. So and you have heard me correctly. And it feels like you just said the opposite. Well, I'm in an audience where I'm supposed to be giving hope. No. And I, don't, I don't care about that. <laughs> F, F, y, F, they, F, T people. <laughs> Because what you just said said something radically different that that it could have it could it could happen. I'm I'm not betting on that. I'm betting on this court being that what, what the wild card is that there are a lot of conservative justice that want to roll back the administrative state, but they don't want to roll back SORNA. Okay. And, and so that's that's where the conflict is. So if you've got a, a, if you if you put if if the liberals hang together and they get two conservatives to join them for whatever reasons it is then you've got you've got uh, you've got a majority but but what are they going to do are the courts generally look for if they hold to their conservative beliefs and this is a conservative court they hold to giving the most limited relief possible to solve the question that's before them so they're not looking to do a broad sweep but sometimes people deviate from their principles when it suits their purposes so we truly anybody who claims they know what's going to happen in gundy they're just <laughs> smoking something funny because we don't know but we do we do know that we're going to get a lot of, of of guidance in terms of where the court is in their thinking when we read all the dicta which is the, the stuff in the decision that's not actually the decision itself like if, for example in the case dealing with uh, dealing in, in north carolina with the gps monitoring and then with the packingham case with the social media there was a lot of runaway dicta in there that said that suggested that that, that the that the Supreme Court is becoming concerned about all these all these conditions, particularly on people who've paid their debt in full. So we got a little bit of where they were in in Packingham, which was the social media ban. They didn't say you couldn't have a social media ban. That what they did say was you can't have a uniform social media ban that's applied to everyone, and a particular to people who've paid their debt to society. You, that that is a green light to North Carolina to go back and narrowly, more narrowly tailor a social media ban, and that's exactly what they're doing. There's a bill pending. I forget the number, 1299 or something, the uh, House bill that's going to do that very thing. And uh, so, so the the courts can't tell legislators to quit legislating. That that that's not their role. The legislature can go back and try to come up with something that's constitutional. That was something that he brought up. Was um, so he goes. Uh, However, the the case got initiated that he was speaking of, and forgive me that I don't remember, but he goes in there and there's clear language that they are overstepping their bounds. So he goes in there and kicks their nuts, and they're like, "What happened?" And then they did it again. So he goes back and kicks their nuts again, and they're like, "Wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa!" And he said, the third time, maybe it was the fourth time, they came back and said, "What could we do different?" And he's like, "I'm a litigator. That's not my job. My job is just to come in here and kick you in the nuts." But the legislature is is now tired of getting their face punched in, to some degree, I, and I don't know to how much degree of hyperbole he's speaking, but it sounds like he is creating some level of scare tactic that they are flinching. That that is correct. Now we we all have a different philosophy. I have a slightly different philosophy in terms of when you kick them in the chin and you and you and you beat them down. I, didn't say chin I believe that you should come back and have a solution because. It's technically not your job, but I believe that I'm, you'd rather me write your legislation than them. And if you don't, and they're going to do, if, if they want a social media ban, would you rather I write it or would you rather they write it? And I think you should trust me slightly more to write the social media ban because I can write one so narrow that it'll apply to virtually no one. Can you describe, you, you told me maybe a couple of weeks ago about something that you helped recraft is that okay to talk about sure, that? Sure. Yeah, I think we talked about it, but we can talk about it about live. Uh, we had uh, uh, we had a, a, a social media ban proposed in 2013 in my state, where that people were going to be banned from social media, and uh, the, the our legislature at that time was almost balanced. We had in the House we had a 36-33 
majority over the Republicans. Now we got a 46 to 24 uh, majority, but we had uh, had a more. And the the Republican leader said, "I got to I got to do this." And and I said, "Well, you can't do it." Indiana, uh, the, the case just came out of Indiana. It says you can't do that. Not a total ban. And and he says, "Well, what can we do?" And I said, "A very strategic." ban if you want to know what you can do i'll tell you what you can do i'm not telling you what you should do but i can write you something that will withstand constitutional muster and uh and 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 he says well will you will you support i said no but i won't oppose it if we write something very narrowly tailored so he had his original version i believe it was house bill 58 2013 if i I remember it right but he had his original version and we went in, and we, I, I told him, this is going nowhere, because we only have a three-seat ma- majority, but we're going to kill it. <laughs> and uh, so, so he, he said, all right, well, then give me something you'll pass. So we narrowed it down to one offense from the whole universe of sex offense. We narrowed it down to just one offense, and that was electronic solicitation. And then the ban only applied to you communicating with a, ni- with a minor, not being on social media, but you could not – knowingly communicate with a minor that wasn't related to you. You had a prohibition against communicating knowingly with a minor that was not a child, or, or I forgot how to define, uh, but I gave a little sc- scope for family members. But otherwise, that was the crime. And I said, now, this is not something that I would spend a lot of time doing, but if you're determined to go out to tell your constituents you've protected them, here's your social media ban. It applies to those who've been convicted of electronic solicitation. It applies only to prohibit them from knowingly reaching out to a minor to engage in a relationship, and it's for the period of their registration, uh, or, or 10 years, no more than 10 years, or the period of their registration if they have less than that, and that's, that's the end of it. And I said, this will pass constitutional muster, and I'll, I'll stand down. Well, that is better than letting the law enforcement apparatus right there, because they won't narrow it down to one offense, and they won't, see, you can, you can prohibit conduct, because a person who has a predis- predisposition to solicit a, solicit a minor, you're prohibiting their conduct that got them in trouble in the first place. So there's nothing constitutionally defective about restricting conduct that might lead to a, to a crime because they have the predisposition having done that crime before. But just because you did any sex offense doesn't mean you have any inclination to have. Uh, have. So I told him, this will pass constitutional muster. Well, then he had a junior member who he claimed had nothing to do with it. He didn't know anything about it. She put an amendment on the floor, which, which is acceptable parliamentary procedure. She added offenses to the registry that they'd been trying to add. And I said, well, that's not the deal, Nate. I said, we're going to have to kill the damn thing. So her floor amendments passed, and then we re-referred it to judiciary. On our side, we got enough votes to re-refer it to judiciary, and we just let it sit there again. And it went nowhere for the rest of the session. But my point is, Paul believes that you just stand back and let them make mistakes. I believe you offer alternatives. We have a slightly different view. But I believe I would rather I write it than them. So it depends on who you trust. (laughs) um, And I just, I mean, you you can't go file a challenge in court because you're not a lawyer. But he's also not a lobbyist. I don't know if that's the word. He's not a political junkie. Right. So, I mean, it, it seems like you two together in the same place at the same time would be a formidable team, possibly, seems to me. Possibly, but North Carolina should, should develop its own talent because, you know, you can't be – one person can't be in the capital of 50 states. But, but that's the type of thing where – I take a lot of grief for doing that, Larry. Why are you working with the opposition? Are you a sellout? And I said, no, I would rather write it than them write it. I guarantee you look at my bill and you look at their bill, tell me which one you'd rather live under. <laughs> so. uh, well, let's move on to, I guess we've had, um, so we had Alyssa Ackerman doing a presentation. She couldn't make it for, I, I think, a medical reason, but then, so we brought her in over Discord or Skype, whichever way you want to look at that. Um, what was your all's opinion of that first presentation to start off the conference? Well, I thought that that... Uh, it was a, a very moving uh, presentation. Uh, she talked a lot about, uh, you know, she told a lot of stories and described restorative justice was the main purpose, which is getting to be very popular these days in criminal justice circles as an alternative, obviously, to criminal justice, where you're, you know, convicted of something, you're immediately separated from 
the person you did the crime against, if you know if you committed one, uh, and you're not allowed to ever find a way to reconcile either directly with the person that you harmed, or even uh, in the she also described vicarious just vicarious restorative justice, which would mean somebody who harmed somebody and somebody who got harmed, but they're not you know each other, uh, but and then they get a chance to talk. And the person who, and, and there's, there's just an opportunity there for healing. She talked a lot about how that, you know, it's not 100% replacement. There, you know, people who commit a crime still need to be punished. Uh, there's, there's still other issues. But if you want healing and if you want prevention, she saw that as a, a real positive Way to look for uh, prevention and a, and a good conversation to have uh, in our own circles. And she mentioned that, which was a nice lead in to a lot of what else is going on in the rest of the day. She kind of closed by saying, You know, I used to be a re- do just researching, I used to just focus on that one thing, but people weren't listening to just those facts. They did listen to the stories. And so she started telling her story as a vic- as a, I shouldn't say just victim she uses that term but as a survivor and and how she has kind of come out as that and working on the restorative justice angle and she said people are listening now and they're getting that message and so that's why uh, she's been moving forward so um, that kind of set the stage actually for a lot of the workshops and things that came after so there's my quick summary Mr. Harris you have a question this is our first live in-person question, I think. I think it is. Yeah, I'm Michael from Indiana um, with Indiana Voices, and I was at the uh, uh, Miss Ackerman's uh, talk today, and I was interested in how she spoke about uh, the fact that you know so many things that happen within the criminal justice system are uh, that people think are going to be healing for them aren't, and I just uh, wanted you to amplify on that a little bit more, if you would. Yeah, I, you're right. I, I remember that, you, you, that that so often, even the person who is a survivor, the, the focus is all on, well, it'll all be better if we just punish them harsh, harshly enough. And that's going to, to be the, you know, that's going to be the solution. And yet, it turns out that it's not, it, it isn't even for the person who's been harmed it's not and then clearly of course it's harmful for the person that's being punished there, there's and, and so that's part of the does there need to be punishment yes but harsher and harsher punishment is not working for the um, is not working to actually uh, you know improve situations decrease you know in, do the public safety so uh, that did that address it a little bit more Michael yeah uh, that I mean that was a good point I kind of glossed over didn't want to completely re- redo her entire lecture. <laughs> and then I guess closing out the day was, I'm going to lose his name, the individual from the... Paul Wright. Paul Wright from Prison Legal News. Yep, he closed the day. Any comments on that? I, I have a feeling that neither of you were there. I don't think either one I of us was. He there. spent a lot of time talking about civil commitment, so I know. I would like to Was finish anybody in the what? audience there that would like to, to share a little of what he said? I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to address what, what oh. Michael said. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. so we'll, we'll back to what Michael said. Yeah, and we did find somebody who was Michael, in the session. So. Um, your, your point was I didn't hear the entire presentation, but I think I got your point. And the, the victims who are advocating for harsher and harsher penalties are not getting the satisfaction they want once those penalties are imposed. That, that I think, was your point. And that's universally true. And one of my favorite people of all time, I don't have many favorite people in, in corrections and in the prison <laughs> side, but one of my favorite people of all time was Dr. Alan Alt. If anybody wants to Google him, it's A-U-L-T. Dr. Alt was the com- commissioner of corrections in Georgia and commissioner of corrections, I think, Mississippi, and maybe Correc- corrections commissioner in South Carolina. Dr. Alt gave execution orders because all those states were death penalty states. He interviewed many victims of, of I mean, dozens in his career. And he said that of all those people, the, the death penalty did not give them the closure and the satisfaction that they thought it would give them, that they were still lacking being made whole. And he's come out and done a, uh, he's done an about 80 and he doesn't want anything to do with the death penalty. And this was a guy who gave execution orders for his entire career. So it, it, the, 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 venge- the vengeance that people think is going to give them the, the closure, it does not. Yeah, that was definitely part of Alyssa's. Now, we did find somebody, if you want to uh, 
do we want this particular individual on? I don't know. I'll have to think this about guy this. He talks funny. He does talk funny. He's from a, he's from a really R Richard, give, give us your name and, and where you're from. Ricardo Montalban. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Where's the plane? The bond. Where's the plane? The plane? The, the plane? plane? The, the plane? plane? The plane? The plane. Richard from New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. You talk funny. I do. Thank you. I didn't think you'd notice. No, no, no. one would ever notice. No. It's, and also, it, it your phone is always very loud when you're on a conference call. It is. Okay. It is. Um, Paul Wright, I thought, was fascinating and interesting. We f First, we have a man who is convicted of murder standing before us, sharing his story. Um, and it was fascinating. Um, I knew a little bit of the background, but the, the details he filled in, I thought, were just interesting in terms of... This is a guy who started in 1990 writing prison news, and before that he was writing from prison itself. Um, and he, he, he created a network of people within prison who was reading his newsletter. Uh, he was sending it out uh, to have it mimeographed and copied and sent to his 75 inmates in different prisons at the time. And now he's got a publication that's distributed nationally, and I don't know how many prisons it goes to. I'm sure it's hundreds, if not thousands. Um, and he gave us an insightful history of uh, his standing up, along with others, but speaking out against the injustices in the, in the criminal justice system. Uh, I, I was truly uh, fascinated by it. Are you done? I am. All right. Do you want to go sit back down? You, you were actually taking a nap. A minute, I was. I was. And then somebody threw a blue ball at you. Did they? Yeah. I they think did. so. Yeah. That, that's what hit you, in case you didn't know. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. And what, what? Did he wake me? I don't he, think so. You, I don't you, know that that's all that You came over here and, and started talking. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we ready to move on to potentially a first article? And I will give you a synopsis because I have done what Larry refers to as a certain name read. I have skimmed this as thoroughly as I possibly can, and I don't see a problem with this. Larry. Which one are you starting? I'm on the first one for the appeal. I don't bet on whether I've got them in any sort of order. They go in order of how they are listed in the Google New Doc. Orleans. So New Orleans police appear to use surveillance to initiate investigations. Here's the synopsis. You go do a na naughty thing, and the police don't actually present themselves to investigate they use all the cameras around no one ever steps foot and that prompts them to in initiate the investigation and they'll call out the canines and all the things and you get punished for n there never being an investigate like a uh, the initiation of an investigation in person only with surveillance cameras why, why is that a problem <laughs> um i i can see I, can't can't a camera be a facsimile for being present well but yeah cameras don't lie so why isn't technology? it invading their privacy larry don't well, they have a, a right to privacy on a serious note in public there is no right to privacy so but, spo no. but suppose you're in a shop store or in a storefront a shop whatever and you know and you're in a convenience store um and something looks suspicious and there, no one even calls and says the person has shoplifted, done anything of the sort, and they're watching the cameras, and that initiates the investigation. It looks here like in the story, uh, a police officer was watching a fellow to getting out of his Volkswagen Beetle carrying a small package. She was somewhere far away, and she was watching this, and they watched him carry his, the small package from one place and going to another and then come out without the package. And that was what they used to initiate the search. So just by her no longer having the package, we have obviously we have yeah. done a drug mm -hmm. deal. Because what else would obviously, you be carrying a package obviously. around, right? Yeah, how would you get out of, go to the other place, come out without the package? What else could you have been doing? What well, else could you possibly have been doing but a drug deal? Well, what level of, what level of reasonable suspicion or probable cause is needed? I honestly don't know the answer to the question. I'm not an attorney. How about you? Can you help us with this? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if they have, if they <laughs> have, if they have, a box, they of, kittens. Order. A box of kittens. A box of kittens. Well, no, a, this, this was a very small box, though, unless it was a dead really kitten. Really little kittens. Well, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a serious note, though, um, uh, I, I didn't read the article, so I don't feel fully versed, but looking, it's all in the eye of the beholder. 
if, uh, I can tell my Greyhound story about where the, they wanted to look in my package before I could go on a bus like 35 years ago, and I said no, and I had only a, a soft drinks in my in my ice chest, but it was the principle of the thing. The the cops the cops when they ask you, it's it's all about how we grew up in our life experience and, and what we think of officers. If you're from a minority and from a poor community, you're less likely to be trusting. And if you're from from affluence and not having any experience with the cops, you think they're overworked and underpaid and they would never they would never invade your privacy, so they must have had reasonable cause. And if you have nothing to hide, the average middle class person has nothing to hide, just go ahead and cooperate with the cop. So it depends on how you're looking at it. If if you've got nothing to hide, why would you mind that's a, that's a lot of people share that view. Can, and you, can you can you elaborate on the inverse of that? So the, the the what you just said, the average middle class white person, when like I have nothing to hide, then then just just lay my chips out on the table. Why should even those people protect their privacy? Why should that be of their interest? Well, because you you could it, anytime liberty is diminished, and law enforcement is allowed to do things without following the due process, which we all support that are attending this conference. Without due process, we have very little in this country. That's what makes us special. We cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. And you can be deprived of all those things, including life, with due process. But for them to deprive you of your personal time and your freedom of movement without any of in, in the various levels of, of from, from beyond a reasonable doubt all the way down to reasonable suspicion, without is reasonable suspicion watching a, a video of someone doing what could be totally innocent behavior? Does that constitute reasonable suspicion? Well, I suppose that if you ask the average person who had no negative experience with the law, they would say, sure it is. What else would they be doing? I mean, so well, I wasn't being totally facetious. It, it mm-hmm. uh, is all related to our life experience. Well, there's actually a uh, – it looks like, Larry, that, that you win the silver dollar in this one because apparently the judge agrees with you. Because the judge says that the officers lacked probable cause because police are not allowed to guess. All that they, they, they need a reasonable suspicion, they need actual indicators, and the reasonable suspicion did not exist to support that he'd committed a crime. So even though, actually, once they did the search, they did find some drugs in his car, but they, they couldn't do the search because they had not established probable cause. Just watching reasonable somebody suspicion. get in and out of the... Yeah, reason. Yeah, that's the lowest level of of, of legal. Right. So, yes. so uh, we have an audience question for you. We there, do because I'm sure it's not for me. No, or me either. I'm sure. Uh, I'm just hi, reading this. Hi, this is John Smith. Um, what do you think about the sneak and peek warrants, also known as delayed notice warrants, that they're executing? Was originally supposed to be just per the Patriot Act against terrorists. And what's happening is more than four-fifths of them are for drug investigations, and less than a handful are now uh, terrorist investigations. And in the beginning, you know, the prosecutor said, trust us, we won't expand this. And what do you know about this, and how does it pertain to the situation in New Orleans? What, what I know is, is not specifics on that question, but what I know is uh, give me a chance to pontificate, which I love to do. Uh, <laughs> That's why this podcast exists, the, by the, the, way. The, the Patriot Act was jammed down our throat after 9-11, and even those who helped with the jamming down our throat have expressed reservations after, after passing it because we were told if we didn't— that's why they called it the Patriot Act. If you don't vote for it, you're not— pay, that was what they said. People Most of got those things are about branding to to a large degree, right? Yeah. Yep. So, so, yep. so give it a good name. They have so to vote the, for it. the the uh, the the administration at the time was George W. Bush, and the Bush administration pushed this through a Republican Congress, and some of those Republicans have said, "Hey, we never visualized this." But see, the problem why they did they didn't visualize it is because they have the trust in the law enforcement apparatus, which typically middle class people have because they've had no reason not to. They've never encountered any adverse experience with law enforcement. So when a prosecutor tells you I'm overworked and understaffed and I would never bring a, a charge against a kid that had a picture of themselves and texted it, you're inclined to believe them, most of you. Even still to this day, a lot of you are inclined to believe that. But it's not the reality. And I, I bragged about our state because we, in 2016, we made it unlawful for prosecutors to prosecute kids and uh, that, that make nudies of themselves. 
we don't give them that discretion because we found out they weren't able to responsibly handle it. So back to this Patriot question, what I know is that that a lot of stuff through the Department of Homeland Security, which I think is, is either the first or second largest uh, department in government, they put all these it's 31 agencies or something agencies like together, and they created this massive bureaucracy, which was the, the, the epitome of what conservatives say that they oppose. They created this massive bureaucracy to, to, to deal with, with this, and it's grown even since the, since the creation. And they're doing so many things that I never would have visualized had anything to do with terrorism. When you hear the department, they're involved in every federal porn investigation. They're involved in every internet uh, solicitation case. You hear a Department of Homeland Security, and we thought when we heard that, if we didn't vote for this, that we were that we were detect we were protecting the country from terrorist threats, primarily external but internal threats that would but would be of 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 a magnitude that would impact the lives of many. But that's not what's happening here. But I don't know about the sneak and peek warrants particularly and the statistics on that. But I know it's a bureaucracy. It's out of control. I know that, that there's a lot of stuff that the Homeland Security would, would be uh, – would be dis- uh, we would be shocked and dismayed that, that they're doing these things. Can you help me with one thing? I encounter – I do a lot of computer security work, and I encounter people who consistently – forever push back saying we're not going to do encrypted text messages and why what would be the argument to get normal law-abiding citizens to appreciate the reason behind securing you know not having so much digital leakage it's for someone like me that's a question for me <laughs> no it's no it actually in this case it's not i know what you're referring to but no it is actually not it's a, it's a question for people like me for sure it's it's laziness, and we don't understand the, the 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 dangers that we're facing. Like most people, don't understand the, these agencies and what they do are so complicated, and they're into so many things. We so I, I push back simply because it's extra work I have to do and extra complexity, and I don't want to do it. But the the, the, the example that I'm, I'm referring to is, is just what we spoke of before. They have nothing to hide, therefore. I don't. I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not doing anything suspect. Whatever. But there's still an argument that you still shouldn't be spied on without some kind of process for your information to be exposed. Well, there again, we 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 fall into that trap. I fall into it. That why would they care about what I'm doing? They've got all these people out there they should be watching that are trying to blow things up. And like, who's interested in what I'm doing? I think I'll have a boring life. So why would anybody be watching me? So I don't believe even the government's watching me. Well, maybe I'm wrong. But but. But they don't care. gathering up all that data and if they decide if they if they decide they want to look at you they've got your past history for the last 20 years everything you've ever texted in plain text by golly they can go hunt it up now isn't that one of the core arguments that the nra uses to not ever let any sort of gun information be in a database so that then bigger government couldn't then have a record of where to find that all is, of the guns that is precisely a, a very effective argument they make so it's, then there shouldn't be any sort of gay people registry because then we could go track down all the gays and, and nuke them because they're all the bad people. And and on and on to make all these different kinds of data collection elements so that maybe sometime in the future we don't end up with something of tyranny that the information is available for someone to use inappropriately. So I, I don't think we connect the dots. I know I don't. Okay. So it, it, I'm I have a hard time like expressing the passion and the importance of it to anybody, and no one follows it. But this just goes along with what we were just talking about prior to that of, well, I don't do anything wrong. I don't speed. I don't take shortcuts. Why would the police be interested in me? I don't mind if they look at my stuff. It's the, it's the exact same thing just in a digital perspective versus in a, in a real-world perspective. So The government doesn't need to collect that data. Google already has it all. But there's a difference of intent there, and I and I and I get that. But like, Google used to have the philosophy of "don't be evil." But they've actually removed that now. But from Google's point of view, you at least know that their intent is from a marketing perspective. They do get you probably know about canary warrants, and so what Google and other companies will do is they'll they'll release quarterly or whatever piece of information says. Up to this point, we have received no uh, uh, requests for information from. You know, four or three, four letter government agencies. And then all of a sudden, that information is removed from the next press release because they, they are bound to not, you know, to, 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 to squelch the information that they have been served a warrant of some sort. So by 
ignoring the information by squelching the information. Now they have affirmed kind of in the assumption that they've now done it. But so at least from the Google point of view, I don't agree with the Facebook side, but the Google point, they are just 100% interested in the, uh, the economy of it. But if they get served a warrant, they have all of the data. They have all of it. And we have another question. Hey, Larry. Andy. Andy, I'm sorry. It's I just okay. had a brain fart there. Uh, I, I just wanted to, this is Mike McKay. I just wanted to address the whole idea that if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to fear. And I, I talk about this a lot with people. And I always use the example, all right, where were you Wednesday night, 7 p.m. in 1979? <laughs> not only do you know, but can you prove it? Because, oh, by the way, we had this crime that has no statute of limitations, and we're thinking about charging you, so just tell us everything you know about what you were doing that particular hour in time. We went after a Supreme Court nominee yeah, about that. Exactly. And, and here's another thing, is that just because you don't believe you've done anything wrong doesn't mean somebody else doesn't believe you've done anything wrong. So you can very easily, you know, they'll say, can I look at your phone? And you'll say, sure, I've not done anything wrong. And they'll, and they'll say, and, I, and they'll say, well, who's this? And you'll say, well, that's my friend who's 22 years old. And they'll say, surprise, she's only 16. <laughs> so you don't think you've done anything wrong, but you can end up in prison just as quickly. And I, here's an example that I use. If they come to you and say, where were you last Wednesday night? And you think to yourself, I've done nothing wrong. I was, you know, uh, in the next town over in Greenville. And they go, great, because we had this murder that just happened in Greenville, you know, uh, last Wednesday night, and you've just now put yourself at the scene of the crime, even though you think you've done absolutely nothing wrong. So, you know, this, this, this idea that I have nothing to hide is what puts a lot of people in prison. And I just wanted to throw that out there, just because you think you're doing nothing wrong doesn't mean they think you're doing nothing wrong, and they will find any way to verify their suspicions. I love, I love that because I can expand it, and when in the criminal defense business, people come to us all the time, and oftentimes they've done something wrong, but occasionally they haven't. And the ones who, who insist that they haven't done anything, and then I break the news to them, well, it, it doesn't really matter what you've done. It matters what they can convict you of. And they say, well, huh? I say, well, it doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what they can convict you of. And, and then they roll their eyes, and then when they, when they get through with that, they say, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, as we look at the, at, the, at the elements of proof and the erosion of the confrontation clause, the, the shield laws and all the things that we cannot do anymore in a trial, and the makeup of the jury pool that's going to come in your jurisdiction, and all the, the restraints we have, they're going to be able to convict you of this. But I didn't do I, They're going to be able to convict you of this. They have the evidence that's going to convict you because so little is required. Well, they don't have any. They don't need any. Well, and they go. On, they don't need that either. And they, well, I, that, well, I said what? Uh, well, they said whatever. So they got. I said the person said you did it. And that's all. They, that's all they need if they're credible. And it, the jury decides. The, the fact finder decides if they're credible. And I said, well, you know, this witness looks to be credible based on the statement that was given to the police and sometimes the police coach people to write a statement but it looks to be credible and when we do the pretrial interviews we'll find out how credible he or she is how well they're going to come across and, and hold up under cross-examination but then the, the hands get tied on cross-examination you can't ask them so many things because of the shield laws in place that the victim's advocates have put in place so we tell them we're not going to ask them nope not going to ask them that nope we won't be able to that nope not, not that either and they say well what I said, well, these are the, the rules that you made through your legislative process. That we, we can't do all these things. And that, so they're going to be able to convict you. <laughs> and, and then you have burden shifting, like it was in Arizona, which went up to the Ninth Circuit, where the burden is on the accused to, to rebut what, what, what it normally should be that the government has to prove beyond <laughs> reasonable doubt of intent to, to commit a crime. Well, the sexual battery statute in Arizona doesn't require that. It only required that, that there be a touching, no sexual intent required. And the accused had to show that it wasn't for sexual motivation. So that, that was a, a, a burden shifting. And we didn't get an, an answer on that because they resolved the case without needing to decide that issue. So it, you, may not be able to be, you may not be guilty of anything, but they can convict you of something. 
And they get really dismayed when I tell them it's, the question is, what can they convict you of, not what did you do? And they say, that just ain't right. I said, yeah, it's not right. But that's the question before us is, what can they, what can they sort of cure conviction on? And if they convict you on all the charges, you, you're subject to a maximum of 37 years. They've offered you a plea deal where you'll get one year in county jail and a five-year probated sentence. Do you want to risk 37 years? And sometimes they roll the dice. And, and more often than not, they don't. Well, on that happy positive note, the next article comes from the New York Times. U.S. requiring social media information from visa applicants. I can't see how this would go wrong at all. Hi, I'd like to get my visa. And can you give me all of your Facebook, your Twitter, your Gmail accounts, all those things, so we can go sift through them and find out who you're friends with? I don't see a problem with this. Well, actually, I'm going to surprise you. I didn't read it thoroughly. I did a skim read. And consistent with our president, who wants to do extreme vetting, Coming into the United States is a privilege, uh, and I can't be inconsistent and claim that people should have a right to come here at will and that we have the, uh, if we don't have the right to, I mean, it's a two-way street. So if we're going to extreme vet people and want to know everything about them that are coming here, then we're shocked when, when we get extreme vetted when we're going other places. But Aren't since, we exceptional? Shouldn't we have different rules for us than them? Of course we should. Um, <laughs> So, and if you believe uh, that, he's got some bridges he can sell you to. So, so, uh, but since you don't have a right to come in the United States, but conversely, United States citizens do not have a right to go to other places, but since you do not have a right to enter the United States, I'm not so sure that, that, that's, that that's off limits. It may be in bad taste, but I'm not so sure that there's a constitutional defect there. Anybody, there. anybody want to rebut? Anybody? Going once, twice? Brenda? No. Nothing? No. All right. Now, now we're ahead of where I had read up to. Uh, Henry Montgomery paved the way for other juvenile lifers to go free. Now at 72, he may never get the same chance. This is from The Intercept, and The Intercept is known for basically producing novels. Larry, did you read this one to know what's going on? Because I didn't put this in there. This I, is all I put you. it in there, but I didn't get a chance to read it. Do you know what's going on? No. All right, then we're going to have to skip that. So, so we're who, gonna put this, who put this in here? That wasn't me. He's blaming you. There's I no put way it, it was it me. There. I put it in there. Um, then I, I was planning to have an extra day for preparation. I know. Somebody <laughs> said we're going to record tonight. Who, who wants to throw just a random subject out for Larry to do the deep dive on the fly? Who's, who's got something to throw at Larry? Mr. Harris, please. Oh, yeah. Hang on one second. We'll get a... Uh... It's kind of along the same lines as what we've been discussing about, but I got an interesting email Um before I came down, and I do a lot of uh, genealogy and have gotten into the DNA gene genealogy thing, and I got a email from um, one of the peer network sharing groups that said that they uh, that they were that the the FBI had been using the DNA data to do cold case solving cold cases and that um, they wanted they encouraged you to opt in to allowing the uh, FBI to use your data but as a general rule they were going to opt you out until you opted in but they highly encouraged you to work with law enforcement um, to help them solve cold cases and the like so. that sounds really helpful well I can't I can't imagine why, if you had a recollection of something you've done, that you would opt in. What? What? Who? Who's the bright person that thought of this? Talking about the, the, the ancestry.com. Ancestry.com. Yes, the, the, the Golden State Killers was, is like the biggest high-profile case around this. Right. There's, been, there's yeah. been a number of them, but yeah, sure. Yeah. But why That's would the you, biggest high-profile? But one. why would somebody who knows they've got something in their past? Because the only reason you'd submit your DNA. So they could catch you. I mean, you know, what other purpose would there be? Well, maybe you just don't think that they're using it this way, well, and you want to find out who your well, ancestors what that are. Michael well, said that, that you could you opt in, in, right? To, to yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's just without one network. That doesn't mean others. Yeah. Well, here's how it's working: is the, the first of all, the companies like Ancestry.com and uh, One Two Three and Me, I think is what it's called. They're, they've, they've been sharing this information with the FBI. First of all, without the knowledge of the people who put their saliva samples into their their service. But the way the FBI is using it 
is that they are testing it and narrowing it down to they're using mitochondrial DNA to narrow it down to who your matriarchal DNA, DNA line is. And so in other words, they're basically narrowing it down to people within your family or people within a specific mm -hmm. genome. And so what they can do is they can test your DNA and say, well, there's a one in a million chance that this DNA is similar familial to the person who committed this crime. Problem is there are 325 million people in the United States. So that means even with that DNA, there's 325 people in the United States that fit that profile of which your son or your uncle or your daughter or whoever they're, they have under suspicion because they're using your DNA to put your son or your other blood relative in jail is what's happening and they're doing it on a one in a million chance which sounds great until you realize how many hundreds of millions of people are in the united states so even a one in a million chance means that there's a chance that 300 people have done this crime but they're targeting your son or your father or whoever happens to be in your family so it's and, and people don't realize this. When, when I put my DNA into Ancestry.com, I don't realize the FBI is going to use that sample to convict my son of something, who, which he may or may not have or done. He might, the chances are one in a million, but there are 300, over 300 million people in the United States. So that narrows it down to 300 people in the United States. But he's probably still going to go to prison on those odds because a jury thinks that those odds are really good. So that's, that's how that's working. This is this is bizarre. Why? Well, I have such a paranoia. I would never give my DNA voluntarily. But this is this is the novelty. This this yeah, the novelty of the, the novelty. Of the but there's also the idea that you could have that super duper specific condition, whether it's kind of innocuous or whether it's something kind of severe. And if we can crowdsource, if we can collect a monumental amount of data and cross check every kind of pattern maybe we can custom tailor that fix for you so wouldn't you want to potentially have that weird thing that has the seventh ear growing out of the side of your head wouldn't you want that cured well yes but but i don't trust government and i don't trust business i'm, I'm uniform in my mistrust a business has a profit motive and they're going to do whatever they can do to make money so, so if, if, if business collects data, they're going to use it in whatever way they can maximize and optimize whatever they've collected. So I'm doing everything I can, including putting bogus information on my Kroger card in terms of who it belongs to, because all it needs is to give you your credits for your, for your discount. So I would not voluntarily surrender my DNA. I've been voluntarily surrendered, but I wouldn't voluntarily surrender because they could use it to target you for insurance discrimination. I mean, they could do so many things with it. This in interest of business, and I know business is pure as the wind-driven snow in, in some people's eyes, but it, not in mine. I don't trust business any more than I trust government. And, and so therefore- Ancestry charges an ass ton of money too. Ancestry is something like 30 bucks a month. I mean, it seems like it would be, I don't know, a couple, but I mean, it's just a database of people, but they are collecting a monumental amount of data. So. And all under the auspices of they give you sort of like heat maps of where your family came from. If you can pay extra. Yeah, you can pay extra when you do your DNA sample to get a medical check, too. Well, let's just pull out. Say I don't have any ideas about statistics in terms of. Let's say Ancestry has DNA on 100 million Americans. And I pulled that out of air. Maybe 30 million. I don't have no idea. But aren't there other businesses who would really love to have that that would be in their, to their benefit to have that uh, to, so they could – tailored their whatever it is their product or service particularly in medical would you trust ancestry not to provide that to, I, I wouldn't so therefore i'm not going to give it to them I, I i'm just not wired to do that <laughs> so, <laughs> so so it that doesn't relate to me because because i'm not wired to go i don't care what difference does it make what about all that ancestry stuff? I have no idea what I'm 10% of this or 40% of that or anything else. I don't know nothing. And it doesn't change a thing. But to some people, it's very important. So to those people, they're, they're doing it. But it, not to me, it's not. They have 3 million paying customers. Well, I wonder, I wonder how many profiles they have. 3 million paying. So they have 20 billion records. They have more records than there are humans alive that they could sift through to cross compare pollinate whatever you want to call it to figure out that 
your 17th removed cousin committed this crime in 1897 because the DNA matches. I don't know. So, yeah, I, my, my paranoia doesn't let me do that. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that I improved uh, your situation of paranoia either <laughs> by those numbers either. Uh, that, I didn't realize that they were that big. That is a, they have 1,600 employees, eight offices worldwide. That is, that is a force. That is a force. Just let's just take to go the other direction. Sergey Brin is one of the founders of Google, and his wife is a biologist, biochemist. I forgot the exact term. She started, I believe, twenty three and Me, because somewhere along the lines in their marriage, Sergey Brin tested positive for some fairly rare. I don't know if it was type two diabetes, something along those lines, but something that later in life. He's going to have massive complications. This is a person that's worth, what, $50 billion. He can buy his way out of anything except for these rare medical conditions. And so through all of that, like 23andMe turns into this massive powerhouse of data collection and and all that. And we could end up in our, in our future of to go to the extreme of I can't think you'll, you'll remember the movie what's the, what's the movie where we're like gene editing kids the Gattaca is that the right name of the movie something like that anyway if you want your kid to have blue eyes if, they, if you want them to be six seven, if you want them to be super duper awesome at basketball if you want them to be a 180 IQ you could tailor your kid to be that but let's pull it way back type 2 type 1 child type diabetes get rid of it eradicate cancer why aren't those the good things that we should go after well, there are the good things we should go after. But you have to give up the data to get there. Well, that's the thing with any technology that we that we we we, we surrender. Where there's there's negative with the, with the positive. You just want to be left out. Uh, I would like to be left out of this. Yes. <laughs> so, but but but, but yes, uh, there's there's good there's good that all the stuff that you, when you swipe your card with your debit card, there's not a soul in this room that's not using a debit card except me, and I use it occasionally. But you're surrendering a whole trail that can put you in bad places of where you might be to, to prompt the government to come ask you about your business. I would rather not the government have that trail about me, so I don't provide it. But if I didn't have anything to hide, why did I care? But I care because I know, oh, well, our records show that you were in Houston, Texas on this day. You're, you're Mr. Consistency, right? Not Mr. Consistency. You, well, you try to, like, I'm going to be intellectually honest on this subject, so therefore I have to maintain I the try, yeah. Okay. You don't want to release that information, but you'll text message freely in the clear. I'm done. Yes. Mike, Mike, <laughs> and I, and I, freely, I freely admitted that I didn't understand the consequences. When I, when I give it to the U.S. government, which the banks are, are basically a, a function of the U.S. government, I, I know that they're federally regulated. I know that the examiners can shut them down. And I know that they carefully respond to anything the government asks about a customer. I know that. I don't know that about the phone companies to the same degree. I know that the phone companies are largely compliant, but I also know that there's some pushback on what the phone companies are giving them. So, so I, I just don't understand. If you convince me that the same thing's happening, I'll probably be just as paranoid. This is Don Thurber. I, I have to agree with Larry uh, because we have repeatedly seen examples in the recent past of companies releasing voluntarily or intentionally releasing people's private data with no repercussions whatsoever. They have faced no accountability for these. So you know the practice is going to continue and they're gonna use this data in any way that they can. And we're at a point in our society today where if you believe that businesses are going to act ethically, you're a fool because they're, gonna, they're going to behave in the way that makes them the most money and that's the reality of our world today. And they don't give a damn whether the, what they're doing is ethical or not. Surveillance capitalism is the term. I got it. You're starting, you're starting to sound like a liberal pointy head. <laughs> Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. 
We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. Um, we do have an article from the Washington Spectator. It, nope. is, it apparently is a .org, so therefore it's a nonprofit. It's the, the what? The Washington Spectator? Never heard of it. It's the last article on the, on the list. It happens to go over civil commitment. And civil commitment's good? I love civil commitment. Do you think, uh, is, is it allowed? It, it, well, I don't know the article, but I love talking about it. I know you do. I, I'm, I'm going to try and like find points out of the article and I'm, just I'm, pepper you with questions to try oh. and get one-liners out of you. I'm just making sure I'm looking at the right article so since I'm, I'm hitting all these brand new. Modern day gulag in the Golden State. There we go. So, the and and this will blend right into the Supreme Court uh, thing next, right? It does. It's okay. Back in 1997, the Supreme Court ruled that the practice known as civil commitment was legal. This meant that 20 states which had passed laws permitting the ongoing incarceration of sex offenders could continue to keep the men confined even after they completed their prison terms. And what's the problem? What would be, I think there was a woman who stood up at the end of um, the final session today, and she described that there was no process for her brother-in-law to get out. He was just trapped there, and he'd been there for 20-plus years. I was in that part of the presentation. That was, yes, I was there. And how, how do we have something in the United States where not only is there, like, not due process this is like the anti-due process and you are just locked away and the key is thrown away and there's nothing you can ever do and they constantly move the goalpost for you to to find any sort of get out of jail yeah that that moving the goalpost i i caught that part of the presentation as well i mean one of the things she was describing was how the they were constantly setting up well here's the routine you have to follow and you jump through these hoops and then he would get through the hoops and oh well well the law has changed or you know we've we've added this new component or whatever it was you know and just constantly and and that's and that seems to be the the run it's like you cannot win so well when i talk about civil commitment i'm very much opposed to to the sex offender civil commitment system that that exists in 20 states but what i what i tell people is that each civil commitment process in the 20 states that have it has to be examined on its merits whether it is constitutional because civil commitment in and of itself is constitutional it's it's something that i think every state in the union does uh, it, it, we have a, these 20 states have a different process by which they commit people for sexual offenses that's far less rigorous in terms of the due process that's afforded to the to the person a regular person it's very difficult to com, to confine a person you might be able to get a 24 or 48 hour hold to, to have an observation and then a person c- could possibly have that hold extended through another process to a, a longer hold, but the 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 goal of of those civil commitment is to restore the person so that they won't be a threat to themselves and primarily to others. We don't really care if people threaten themselves anymore as long as that's the only person. That, but that's a component of the official test as a person who's danger to themselves or others. Well, if we committed everybody as a danger to themselves, we would have so many asylums that we couldn't build them fast enough because a lot of the homeless population they're dangerous to themselves. And they would qualify. They would have qualified in the old days to be committed civilly, because they're not able to care for themselves, and they're not able to keep themselves safe. But no, we don't do that anymore because the the institutionalization started in the 70s, probably probably more so in the 60s. But we we accelerated through the 70s and 80s, and we had a convergence of liberalism and conservatism. The liberals said that you have the right to be different, odd, ah, and just because you act weird and you do the things that would get a person committed, you go to, go to get a, a medical doctor and a couple of family members say this person's acting nutty and they could be committed, and sometimes they'd be committed for a very long time. Well, as that evolved with the psychotropic drugs, uh, the Thorazines and whatever different drugs they use, civil commitment became less and less used, and we have a very, very small number of people civilly committed in the United States very small number you have a state like in arkansas they might have 200 people in civil commitment the entire state but then the sex offender civil commitment is less robust it doesn't even take a mental disease or defect it usually takes a mental abnormality and then the person's already served a prison sentence so they're stone broke and they have no money to fight and then these petitions to civilly commit them are filed 
saying this person should be locked away because they have a mental abnormality that makes them have a propensity to have urges they cannot control. What are urges that they can't control? And they, they lock these people up. And then the goal is not to get them out. The goal is to keep them there. And, and the goal is, is that, that the vengeance that they got from the prison sentence is not sufficient. And society wants to continue to impose a restraint on their liberty, so they create something that, that has the v very minimum necessary to qualify as treatment. In some cases, they can't even disguise it as treatment. They're, they, they're locked in a prison ward. They, they, they're not doing anything but just serving additional time. But in some cases, like in Minnesota, they are actually in facilities that provide something that, that's called treatment. But they, they, they're trying to keep these people there for, 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 a, for a long period of time because the bureaucracy is built and the, the apparatus has to be fed. So the goal is to keep them there. Will you remember John Hinckley? Everybody's heard the name John Hinckley? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the goal with John Hinckley, he was civilly committed. After, after his trial, and he was found not guilty by insanity. He was civilly committed. The goal was to release Mr. Hinckley after he was rehabilitated. Now the goal was to keep him in prison until till President Reagan passed away. But after he passed away in 2004, the goal was to get him out of, out of civil commitment. The goal was to figure out how we can restore him to a level that he doesn't pose any threat to anyone because he shot five people in, 19, in 1981. And that is the tragedy of the sex offender civil commitment. Civil commitment in and of itself is an acceptable thing to do. If you provide due process, remember, no deprivation of liberty, property, without due process. So conversely, with due process, a person can be deprived of their liberty. But the liberty has to be deprived through that process. And with a civil deprivation of liberty, it has to be with the goal of returning them to the citizenry as quickly as possible. So civil commitment has to be fixed. But the problem is every case that's gone up to the court, they have found, like in the Minnesota case, they found that there was enough due process there, even though no one's ever gotten out or had at that time. I don't think anyone had gotten out. I think maybe a handful have gotten out since. But, but, but no one had gotten out. But they said, that doesn't mean that you can't get out. That just means that you haven't gotten out. And it was a poor selection of plaintiffs because one person who had been in there hadn't even been there long enough to go through the process to get out that existed. So, so it, 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 civil commitment is a tragedy. But we, we can't expect the courts to fix it because it's not unconstitutional necessarily on its face. It may be unconstitutional as it's applied in a particular situation, but the courts cannot say civil commitment is unconstitutional because you can deprive a person of liberty with due process. It says here in the article, it says, each year, Coalinga, which is not when the woman sp stood up and she said... That's the one she was talking about. I was like, hey, so here the irony, the coincidence of here. So each year, Coalinga Hospital's operating budget spirals upward. In 2017, wait for it, $280 million budget. The next year, 322 And this year, it's 333 To house 953 SVP, sexually violent predators, and 370 non-sex offenders called mentally disordered patients. They spend $333 million a year. That would fix California's budget. I don't think it would fix their budget, but it's a hugely large amount of money being spent, and those people do not want to give those jobs up. That's what people lose sight of. Once a bureaucracy is created, can anybody raise their hand, uh, show hands of people who've worked for anything that wants to see their job go away? And it don't have to be a government. It can, it can be private sector. Does anybody know of where they've advocated the abolition of their job? Uh, it, it doesn't happen. Well, hang on. Let me ask. Like, so, so Narsol is in business to try and, and strike down the registry. Doesn't that mean you guys are going to give up your salaries? Well, first of all, there's there's no salary, but they will they will, they will they they will never stop coming for you. So when when I'm long since gone from this effort, there will be victims advocates, law enforcement apparatus advocating for bad public policies. There will always be a need for a NARSL, just like there's always a need for the ACLU 100 years after its creation. There will always be a need for, for, for what we do because as long as there are citizens who are willing to propose bad public policy, as long as there are law enforcement who are willing to propose bad public policy, we need to be there because otherwise it'll pass. And it's gonna keep passing until we're better prepared to deal with each proposal and we're not adequately prepared, nowhere near adequately prepared. We're marginally prepared in a handful of states. And, well, I'd say fairly well prepared in a handful of states, marginally prepared in another handful of states. And there's a, a whole bunch of states where we have no preparation to deal with, with the bad proposals that are coming down. I heard a person stand up during one of the presentations today and was, like, visibly shaking, saying how bad he hated the ACLU. 
I didn't hear the context behind it. I just caught that, and I, I immediately referenced to you that we brought it up. And then we've actually gotten a decent number of people on the podcast saying, I donate money. Well, uh, I've, I've not ever been able to see an ACLU card at one of these things. And so if, is anybody a member of the ACLU in here? I am. So we got one. Two. 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 Okay. So, uh, uh, so what I say in response to that is the ACLU is a business. It's not a government entity. It's a business that tries to stay alive, and it has to have funding capital. And it relies on its members for a big portion of that capital, and it relies on winning cases as another big portion of its funding as a prevailing party. So they focus on things that, A, are a priority for their members, and, B, that they think they can win. They need funding either as a winning party or from their if it's something that their members are passionate about. Well, most of the things that their members are passionate about are things that conservatives are not passionate about. And, and therefore, since our group tends to lean more to the conservative side politically, we're not going to have a lot of people that are going to be a member of the ACLU. And because they're for things that conservatives don't support. They're, 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 that's just, I mean, uh, uh, reproductive rights, uh, marital choice, things that, that, that progressives are for that's not what conservatives are so so we end up with our audience being primarily conservative wanting something from an organization that 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 they are just so diametrically opposed to practically everything they stand for they're taking god out of the schools they're putting gays into the scouts they're doing all these evil things to the united states so therefore i hate them but then i hate the fact that they don't do anything for me <laughs> And and I and I find that very confusing because I would never think of calling on a conservative organization that I despise to be my savior, but that seems to be what happens here. They say, "Where is the ACLU?" And I said, "Well, you you, you need to be a supporter of the ACLU." And then you get because they send out questionnaires. What are your priorities? You get those, don't you? And they look at those and they they look at where their memberships uh, positions are and they look at they look at that as a significant part of how they prioritize their resources and then winning litigation brings money to your coffers they don't see this as a winnable thing they will they'll take on the first amendment stuff like like on social media bans they'll take and and aclu michigan went beyond that but the things they see that they can win they'll jump on because that's what it's about we're the same way we're looking at cases we can win because we have a small litigation pot and we're trying not to to have it evaporate. So we're, we're at Narsal, we're looking: can we win this? Do we have a reasonable probability of winning this? Or we're we just gonna we're just gonna waste this money so we can feel good that we tried. And uh, so that's that's what keeps the ACLU is that, that they don't have the resources. They they're gargantuanly larger than us, but they don't have the resources to tackle all this stuff. You'll have ACLUs that have no staff attorneys at all. Yeah, or they'll have one staff attorney. Yeah, in Maryland, I know uh, the ACLU there does have a core staff, but most of the litigation they do in, in my state is done by volunteer attorneys. Corporate, they, they cooperating attorneys, to, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they may be actual attorneys that work with them, but they'll say they'll call up attorney number three and say, hey, we've got this case we'd like to file. Where are you willing to work with us on and it? That's it's, called a cooperating attorney. So, okay. they'll, so they'll have, they'll have uh, and they'll, they'll share the fee award if they, if they prevail. Yeah. So, but but in terms of having a, a vast apparatus, uh, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. They they really don't. I mean, they're mammothly larger than us, but they're still they're still a speck of what it would take to challenge all the things that are being done wrong. You could devour the legal fees in the Michigan case, not not the new case, but the one that went to the Dose versus Snyder the, uh, number one. We're on number two now, but number one. It, when it was all tallied up and all the hours that they had from the law school and from the ACLU Michigan and expert cost, the settlement with the state of Michigan was $1.8 million. Very few law firms can afford that. That's the risk you've got. And, and, and of course, I'm sure that some of those fees could have been trimmed back. They might have charged for some hours that they didn't work and the, they might have charged three fifty an hour versus you might charge a private party $200 but when you're getting the government. So, but still, those are, those are hugely complex inexpensive pieces of litigation. So the ACLU just can't do all the stuff that, that people would like them to do. And they didn't ask me to do, say, I've said this long before they were ever here. <laughs> so, so this is stuff I've said for, for, since the get-go. That You can hate the ACLU, but they do what they think is in their interest. Larry, so, I just received a question from chat. There's nobody in chat. There's one person in chat. I have a question for you. Did you bring your showerhead? Of course I brought my shower head. 
Can we can we take a poll from the audience? How many people packed a shower head? Hang on, every, every, hang on, hang on. I'm looking across every, the audience. Every hand went up. Yeah. E- every Don't you bring hand. shower heads to to any time you go to a hotel. How, how about a a, 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 a wrench? A shower cap count. No, no, not for your no, head. No, no, not for no, your no, head. No, the, 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 the shower head itself. Did, the shower did you head bring, itself. Did you bring a fan? I had a fan brought. I didn't bring it. Okay. Plunger? Plunger? No plunger. Because you're flying, right? You, you, you would have driven. Flew, so yes. you could put the plunger so, in your suitcase. Okay. So, so can, can we, can, do we, need, we need an abacus to do the counting of the audience to see how many people brought see, shower okay, heads? Yeah, yeah. The, so can you all raise your hands again? I'm zero. A zero and a zero and a zero. So nobody here. So now we have a scientific study that has been done to prove to Larry. He's like, doesn't everybody? So we now have it in stone that no one here brought a shower hat. I, I don't. I don't. I don't believe what I'm seeing because I, I expected every hand to go up. <laughs> Would you like to talk about Antonin Scalina? So uh, I. I do that. I, I carry towels also. <laughs> And I, I ask people not to grab my hands because I have this condition that my bruise and even a rough. If you've noticed hotel towels, you might as well pull out a number 40 grit sandpaper as far as my skin's concerned. I don't know about yours, but if I start rubbing a hotel towel, I'm going to start tearing my skin on my hands where the, where the problems are. So he's so, got a good excuse so, for the towels. So I, I carry towels. And then when I take a shower, I use some therapeutic shampoo, and I like to get all of it out rather than leaving any residue. And most of the hotels... Not necessarily this one, but most of the hotels have gone on water conservation, so you end up, where's the water? And rather than going up against a block wall of of arguing about there's no water pressure, I just remove theirs, put mine in, have all the water I need, then I put theirs back in. And it it goes with me, so to me it's a perfect solution to a common problem, no water flow. (laughs) So so that's what we're going to have Scalia on the Constitution. People that criticize you for this say a lot of the Constitution was phrased in a deliberately vague way. That they realized when they framed it that in generations to come, things may change, which may put a different impression on a particular piece of text. Right. Why are you not prepared to accept that that means you can move with the times to evolve it? Oh, I, but I, I do accept that with, with respect to those vague terms in the Constitution, such as equal protection of the laws, due process of law. Uh, uh, cruel and unusual punishments. I, I fully accept that those things have to apply to new phenomena that didn't exist at the time. What, what I insist upon, however, is that as to the phenomena that existed, their meaning then is the same as their meaning now. For example, the death penalty. Uh, some of my colleagues who, who are not textualists, or not originalists at least, uh, believe that it's, uh, it's somehow up to the court to decide uh, whether the death penalty uh, remains constitutional or not. That, that's not a question for me. It's absolutely clear that whatever cruel and unusual punishments may, may mean with regard to future things such as uh, death by injection or the electric chair, it's clear that, that the death penalty in and of itself is not considered cruel and unusual punishment. But more and more Americans are coming around to thinking the death penalty is an anachronistic thing. You know, 50 years ago, even when you began, you're the longest serving Supreme Court justice, when you began, you know, the majority of Americans, big majority, would have been in favor of the death penalty. That is beginning to change. And you're seeing it, you know, for want of a better phrase, going out of fashion. One of the reasons being the introduction of DNA, establishing that a large number of people on death row didn't commit their crimes. How do you equate that as a man of fairness and justice? How do you continue to be so pro something which is so obviously flawed? I, I'm not pro. Uh, people, I don't insist that there be a death penalty. All I insist upon is that the American people never proscribed the death penalty, never adopted a constitution which said the states cannot have the death penalty. If you don't like the death penalty, fine. Some states have abolished it. You're quite wrong that it's a majority. It's a small minority of the states that have, that have abolished it. Majority still still permit it, but uh, I'm not uh, pro death penalty. I'm I'm just anti the notion that it is not a matter for democratic choice. That it has been taken away from the democratic choice of the people by a provision of the Constitution. That's simply not true. The the American people never ratified a provision which they understood abolished the death penalty. When the cruel and unusual punishments clause was adopted, the death penalty was the only penalty for a felony. So and all we'd have to do is amend the Constitution. I mean, it can be amended. So it is changeable. But it's changeable by a process, not by asking the judiciary to make up something that is not there in the text. Right. I find his position to be incredibly fascinating that he, it has nothing to do with what his opinion 
of whether death penalty is good or bad. It, it doesn't matter to him. He's just reading the text and saying it's just not defined in there. So because it's not defined, we can do it. That's that's why I have have uh, he's going to be a, a regular segment till I run out of good good segments on him, which will take some time because there's a lot out there. But a lot of things I say is similar to him. Not that I'm philosophically in agreement, but when you're interpreting the law, if you are a textualist, which our people, many of them say they are, well, he's just saying that that's what he doesn't see a prohibition in the Constitution. And, and, and we we decided not to go with the second part of that, which was about abortion. We'll do that another time. But it's the same thing with, with laws that you don't agree with. Just because you don't agree with it doesn't make it unconstitutional. And I, I, I talked about a Maryland case from her, her state where they, they, they prosecuted a person for texting an image of themselves. Uh, it, the person was only 16, I think, at the time. Well, it's not unconstitutional to have that as a crime. It's bad public policy, but it's not unconstitutional. If you don't like 16-year-olds being prosecuted for possessing porn, then you have to change the law. Don't ask the courts to save you from bad public policy. And, and that's, a, that, that's, that's the point I'm making. If you're strictly by the text, the Nebraska case we've talked about multiple times on the podcast where a person moved from Colorado to Nebraska and he was it required to register in Nebraska based on his Colorado conviction, they don't register juveniles in, Colorado, in, in Nebraska. And, and, but the law says any person who relocates to Colorado who's required to register in another state. So the, the Nebraska Supreme Court said, well, let's take a look at this. You are a person. Yes, yes, I'm a person. You did move to Colorado, I mean, for, to, to Nebraska from Colorado, where you were required to register, yes. Well, the, that's what it says. It says any person, and we're going by the text. Well, the, there are people who believe that, it, that you will get more into purposivism and, 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 and results of a decision. There are those who believe that you should look at the purpose. Well, Nebraska, their purpose of their registry is not to include juveniles. That's their purpose if you have a, a Nebraska conviction. But that's not the way they amended the law that says if any person. So the, the Nebraska Supreme Court says, well, you're a person. You did move here, and you do have to register in Colorado. So it sure looks like to us you have to register here. We end the inquiry there. We don't get into whether it's a good – that's Scalia. There's, there's, he doesn't get into the policy about it. He says, well, if, if the people want that – that's what they can have unless it flies in the face of the Constitution. And he doesn't see that cruel and unusual punishment violates the Constitution. He may not like it. It may be unsound. It may cost millions of dollars to put people to death. And you may make mistakes. But the Constitution doesn't guarantee you a perfect trial. It guarantees you a process that's called due process. But your life can be deprived. You can be deprived of life after the process is complete, even if it's wrong. Is that uh, a case in, in, in this specific case where – we need to be at the table aware of these things to point out where that gap is, where the Venn diagram doesn't line up right for us to go, hey, these people may move in here. You already have this in place, but if this happens, they're not compatible and you're going to end up with a problem? That is correct. In, in Nebraska, there was no one there when they were drafting that law. It never occurred was to them. Hank? Not at the time they drafted that law. He wasn't <laughs> there. But, but there was no one there telling them, with this language, you need a person who's very zeroed in on policy, and you try to imagine bad things. So someone has to imagine how that it could be misused, because if it can be, it will be. And so the law enforcement apparatus is looking at it and saying, well, he moved here. He does, it does seem to fit. So the, the law enforcement apparatus, they're not going to call attention to that defect. They may, may have noticed it. But without an advocacy group in Nebraska that's effectively tracking legislation and offering alternative language, then that got through because no one spotted it. No one thought anything about it. Now they're thinking a lot about it. About 85 kids are in jeopardy of having, to, when I say kids, people that were convicted as, uh, adjudicated as juvenile, about 85, I think, are in jeopardy of having to be illuminated because of this ruling. And I think there's some kind of stay in place because they, they cobble together some kind of federal claim to, to stop the, the, for, for taking those people alive. But the point beyond Nebraska is that if you're a textualist, you should be for a literal interpretation. You should not be for the courts substituting their judgment for what would be a better public policy. That's for us to decide as citizens. And if we don't like our public policy, if we don't like it, it's a reflection of the public. Don't ask the courts, to, unless you're a judicial activist who believes in legislating from the bench. Otherwise, it's our job to stop this stuff through the legislative process, through expressing the will of the people. I agree with Scalia on that. 
I don't want people wearing robes. What if they start deciding things that I don't want as public policy? I don't want those robes deciding public policy. I want those robes to decide when we've gone beyond where the Constitution allows us to go. So I believe in a pretty limited judiciary. And so it's our job to prove unconstitutionality. It's not our job to run to say, well, that's bad public policy. You could do it a better way. The registry would be more effective if you, if you did it. That's not the court's role. The court's role is to tell you if you can register people under that particular scheme. The court's role is not to tell you the most efficient way. The, the, Michigan, they're not going to come up with it. The, the, the courts are going to end up having to, to strike the things that are no longer constitutional and apply it to everybody because the legislature, in all likelihood, is not going to come up with something. It's politically suicidal. So my prediction is that the courts will end up having to say, well, you just can't do these things, but they're not going to rewrite those. It's not their job either. So they're going to strike the things that they're no longer able to do. It's called severability. So they're going to they're going to decide that that the provisions of Michigan law they're unconstitutional. They're going to decide that they're severable. They're going to sever those out of the law, and they're the remaining law that I think is going to st stand. I hope I am wrong, but I don't see a legislative fix in the works. Mayor, we are coming like right shy of ninety minutes. So I think it's time for it's us time. to thank our audience. And and where is We've lost some of them. They, they have um, sort of escaped. While it's you been were, a long day, Larry. Well, we've only been. been going 12 hours. I, I, some of us longer. Some of us were much longer. Some of us much longer. Brenda, thank you so very much for joining in. I was happy to do it. And, and Larry, of course, as always. Thank you. And, and Michael, thank everyone. And, and Michael again. And Don, those are the ones that I remember asking a question. And I don't know your name. John Smith. John Smith. No one will ever figure out who John Smith is. And don't forget, don't forget Richard. <laughs> Yeah, Richard. <laughs> Who could forget Richard? <laughs> Thank you, audience, so very much Yay, for joining audience. us. Appreciate Yay! it. Woo! Woo! And before we head out, Larry, how can we grow the podcast? What's the website? Uh, I don't remember. It's registrymatters.co. Yes, I remember now. And then there's a phone number. I'm sure you remember the phone number. 747-227-4477. Awesome. And do you know the email address or do I have to do that one too? Uh, it's registry registry matters cast at gmail. Outstanding, and of course, Larry. Right, what is the best way to support the podcast? Uh, that that one is to donate your entire gross paycheck. Yes. Gross paycheck. Gross paycheck. <laughs> Patreon.com slash registry matters. And with that, I bid you all adieu. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for coming out. You're listening to FYP.